This is a recording of an article on Wikipedia and was recorded by user Popular Outcast. The material recorded is current as of the June 7, 2008 revision of the article. The World Without Us from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. The World Without Us is a nonfiction book about what would happen to the natural and built environments if humans suddenly disappeared written by American journalist Alan Weissman and published by St. Martin's Thomas Dunn Books. It is a book-length expansion of Weissman's own February 2005 Discover article, Earth Without People. Written largely as a thought experiment, it outlines, for example, how cities and houses would deteriorate, how long man-made artifacts would last, and how remaining life forms would evolve. Weissman concludes that residential neighborhoods would become forests within 500 years, and that radioactive waste, bronze statues, plastics, and Mount Rushmore will be among the longest-lasting evidence of human presence on Earth. The author of four previous books and numerous articles for magazines, Weissman traveled around the world to interview academics, scientists, and other authorities. He used quotes from these interviews to explain the effects of the natural environment and to substantiate predictions. The book has been translated and published in France, Germany, Portugal, and Spain. It was successful in the U.S., reaching number six on the New York Times bestseller list and number one on the San Francisco Chronicle bestsellers list in September 2007. It ranked number one on Time and Entertainment Weekly's top ten nonfiction books of 2007. The book has received largely positive reviews, specifically for Wiseman's journalistic and scientific writing style, but some have questioned the relevance of its subject matter. The following is a listing of the contents of this article. Section 1. Background. Section 2. Synopsis. Section 3. Publication. Section 4, Reception. Section 5, Genre. Section 6, Televisions, Specials. Section 7, References. Section 8, External Links. The following is an info box which accompanies this article and gives a summary of the main information about the world without us to supplement the arrangement of information in this article. The author is Alan Weissman. The country is United States. The language is English. The genre is nonfiction. The publisher is St. Martin's Thomas Dunn Books. The publication date was July 10, 2007. The media type was print in hardback. Pages is 336. The ISBN 10 number is 03123472294. ISBN 13 number is 978-031-234-7291. An image with no caption accompanies the info box and displays the front cover of the book, The World Without Us. Section 1. Background. Before The World Without Us, the author, Alan Weissman, had previously written four books, including Gaviotas, A Village to Reinvent the World in 1998 on an eco-village in Colombia, and An Echo in My Blood in 1999 on his family's history immigrating from Ukraine to United States. He has worked as an international journalist for American magazines and newspapers, and at the time of writing was an associate professor of journalism and Latin American studies at the University of Arizona. The position required him to teach only one class in the spring semester, and he was free to travel and conduct research the rest of the year. The idea of the world without us was suggested to Weissman in 2003 by Josie Glaucius, an editor at Discover. She had pondered the idea for several years and asked Weissman to write a feature on the subject after she read Journey Through a Doomed Land, an article he published in 1994 in Harper's Magazine about the state of Chernobyl eight years after abandonment. His Discover article, Earth Without People, published in the February 2005 issue and reprinted in the Best American Science Writing 2006 anthology, describes how nature has thrived in the abandoned Korean demilitarized zone and how nature would overwhelm the built environment of New York City. 
Using interviews with paleoecologists, the article speculates that megafauna would return and that forest cover, like Believesca forest, would spread over Europe and the eastern United States. The article raises the prospect of failing power plants, chemical plants, dams, and petroleum tanks. To expand this into a book, Weissman's agent found an editor and publisher at St. Martin's Press. Among the 23-page bibliography are two articles he wrote for the Los Angeles Times Magazine, Naked Planet on Persistent Organic Pollutants, and The Real Indiana Jones on the Mayan Civilization, and one published in the Conde Nast Traveler, Diamond in the Wild, on diamond mining, as well as Discovers Earth Without People. Additional research saw Weissman travel to England, Cyprus, Turkey, Panama, and Kenya. Interviews with academics quoted in the book included biologist E.O. Wilson on the Korean Demilitarized Zone, archaeologist William Rathje on plastics and garbage, forest botanist Oliver Rackham on vegetative cover across Britain, anthropologist Arthur Demarest on the crash of Mayan civilization, paleobiologist Douglas Irwin on evolution, and philosopher Nick Bostrom on transhumanism. Section 2 Synopsis The book is divided into 19 chapters with a prelude, coda, bibliography, and index. Each chapter deals with a new topic, like the potential fates of plastics, petroleum infrastructure, nuclear facilities, and artworks. It is written from the point of view of a science journalist, with explanations and testimonies backing his predictions. There is no unifying narrative, cohesive single-chapter overview, or thesis. Wiseman's thought experiment pursues two themes. How would nature react to the disappearance of humans, and what legacy would humans leave behind? To foresee how other life could continue without humans, Weissman reports from areas where the natural environment exists with little human intervention, like the Baliavesca Forest, the Kingman Reef, and the Palmyra Atoll. He interviews biologist E.O. Wilson and visits with members of the Korean Federation for Environmental Movement at the Korean Demilitarized Zone, where few humans have penetrated since 1953. He tries to conceive how life may evolve by describing the past evolution of prehistoric plants and animals, but notes Douglas Irwin's warning that, quote, we can't predict what the world will be five million years later by looking at the survivors, end quote. Several chapters are dedicated to megafauna, which Weissman predicts would proliferate. He profiles soil samples from the past 200 years and extrapolates concentrations of heavy metals and foreign substances into a future without industrial inputs. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and implications for climatic change are likewise examined. With material from previous articles, Weissman uses the fate of the Mayan civilization to illustrate the possibility of an entrenched society vanishing and how the natural environment quickly conceals evidence. To demonstrate how vegetation could compromise human-built infrastructure, Weissman interviewed hydrologists and employees at the Panama Canal, where constant maintenance is required to keep the jungle vegetation and silt away from the dams. Illustrating abandoned cities succumbing to nature, Weissman reports from Chernobyl, Ukraine, and Varasha, Cyprus, abandoned in 1986 and 1974, respectively. Weissman finds their structures crumbling as weather does unrepaired damage and other life forms create new habitats. In Turkey, Weissman contrasts the construction practices of the rapidly growing Istanbul, as typical for large cities in lesser developed countries, with the underground cities at Cappadocia. And due to a large demand for housing in Istanbul, much of it was developed quickly with whatever material was available and could collapse in a major earthquake or other natural disaster. Cappadocia was built thousands of years ago out of volcanic tuff and is likely to survive for centuries to come. Weissman uses New York City as a model to outline how an unmaintained urban area would deconstruct. He explains that sewers would clog, underground streams would flood subway corridors, and soils under roads would erode and cave in. From interviews with members of the Wildlife Conservation Society and the New York Botanical Gardens, Weissman predicts that native vegetation would return, spreading from parks and out surviving invasive species. Without humans to provide food and warmth, rats and cockroaches would die off. 
Weissman explains that a common house would begin to fall apart as water eventually leaks into the roof around the flashings, erodes the wood, and rusts the nails, leading to sagging walls and eventual collapse. After five hundred years, all that would be left would be aluminum dishwasher parts, stainless steel cookware, and plastic handles. The longest lasting evidence on earth of a human presence would be radioactive materials, ceramics, bronze statues, and Mount Rushmore. In space, the Pioneer plaques, the Voyager Golden Record, and radio waves would outlast the Earth itself. Breaking from the theme of the natural environment after humans, Weissman considers what could lead to the sudden, complete demise of humans without serious damage to the built and natural environment. That scenario, he concludes, is extremely unlikely. He also considers transhumanism, the voluntary human extinction movement, and John A. Leslie's The End of the World, The Science and Ethics of Human Extinction. Weissman concludes the book considering a new version of the one-child policy. While he admits it is a, quote, draconian measure, end quote, he states, quote, the bottom line is that any species that overstretches its resource base suffers a population crash. Limiting our reproduction would be damn hard, but limiting our consumptive instincts may be even harder, end quote. He responded to criticism of this saying, quote, I knew in advance that I would touch some people's sensitive spots by bringing up the population issue, but I did so because it's been missing too long from the discussion of how we must deal with the situation our economic and demographic growth have driven us to, end quote. Section 3, Publication. The book was published in the United Kingdom by Virgin Books and in Canada by HarperCollins. It has been translated and published in France by Group Flammarion as Homo Disparatus, in Germany by Piper as Die Welt on uns, in Portugal by Polar Star as O Mundo Sem Nos, and in Poland by CKA as Siat Bes Nas. Pete Garceau designed the cover art for the American release, which one critic said was, quote, a thick layer of sugar-coated sweetness in an effort to not alarm potential readers. Yes, I am a book about the environment, but I'm harmless. No, really, end quote. The Canadian version designed by Ellen Cipriano is similar to the American version, but with a photo illustration rather than a disarming cartoon illustration. Cover art for the international releases contrasts the natural environment with a decaying built environment. Adam Grupper voiced the 10-hour-long, unabridged English-language audiobook, which was published by Macmillan Audio and BBC Audiobooks, and released simultaneously with the hardcover book. Audiophile gave the audio presentation its earphones award, calling Grupper's reading sincere and balanced and wrote, quote, never veering into sensationalism, always objective and phlegmatic. Grupper takes what could be a depressing topic and makes it a book you just can't stop listening to, end quote. An image accompanies this section of the article with the caption, the American, Canadian, British, and French book covers. Section 4, Reception The book was released on July 10, 2007, as Weissman launched his book tour with stops throughout the United States, Canada, and overseas to Lisbon and Brussels. Weissman did television interviews on The Daily Show and The Today Show, and radio interviews on Weekend Edition, Talk of the Nation, The Diane Rehm Show, Living on Earth, Marketplace, and As It Happens. Meanwhile, the book debuted on the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction hardcovers at number 10 on July 29th, and spent nine weeks in the top 10, peaking at number 6 on August 12th and September 9th. In the Canadian market, it spent 10 weeks on the Globe and Mail's nonfiction bestseller list, peaking at number 3 on August 11th. The book reached number one on the San Francisco Chronicle bestsellers list for nonfiction on September 23rd and spent 11 weeks on the USA Today's top 150 best-selling books, peaking at number 48. Reviewers at the Library Journal recommended the book for all environmental collections and the audiobook for most public and academic library audiobook collections. The book ranked number one on Time and Entertainment Weekly's top ten nonfiction books of 2007 and was listed in the Hudson Booksellers' Best Books Published in 2007. 
In the Amazon.com Best Books of 2007, it placed number four overall in the United States and number one in the nonfiction category in Canada. The writing style was positively received as being vivid and well written, sometimes grim, but with appropriate language. Even an overall negative review by Michael Grunwald in the Washington Post remarked the writing was, quote, always lucid, sometimes elegant, end quote. In the New York Times book review, Jennifer Shustler said Weissman has a, quote, flirtation with religious language, his occasionally portentous impassivity giving way to the familiar rhetoric of eco-hellfire, end quote. Janet Maslin of the New York Times found the writing had, quote, an arid, plain, what-if style, end quote, while being, quote, strangely uniform in tone, end quote. On the reporting techniques, Camilla wrote that, quote, Weissman's science reporting, at once lucid and full of wonder, is the heart and soul of this book, end quote, and that it is, quote, written as if by a compassionate and curious observer on another planet, end quote. The Plain Dealer book editor, Karen Long, said Weissman, quote, uses the precise, unhurried language of a good science writer and shows a knack for unearthing unexpected sources and provocative facts." End quote. Several critics found the lack of an anthropomorphic point of view to hurt the book's relevance. Robert Braille in the Boston Globe wrote that it has, quote, no real context, no rationale for probing this fantasy other than Weissman's unsubstantiated premise that people find it fascinating, end quote. Michael Grunwald in the Washington Post also questioned the premise. Quote, Imagining the human footprint on a post-human planet might be fun for dormitory potheads who have already settled the questions of God's existence and Fergie's hotness, but it's not clear why the rest of us need this level of documentary evidence. End quote. On the other hand, Alana Mitchell in the Globe and Mail Review found relevance in the context of society's passiveness to resource depletion combined with an anthropomorphic vanity. She writes the, quote, book is designed to help us find the how of survival by shaking us out of our passive dance with death, end quote. The book's environmental focus was also criticized by some. Christopher Orlett of the American Spectator wrote that it is, quote, a prime example of the wrong-headed extremist views of the Greens, end quote. Braille agrees that the book could be, quote, an environmentalist's nightmare, possibly fueling the cheap shots taken at the Green movement by critics who say environmentalists care more about nature than people, end quote. Environmentalist Alex Steffen found the book presents nothing new, but that using the sudden and clean disappearance of humans provides a unique framework, although extremely unlikely and insensitive. Two critics who call the book a, quote, Jeremiah, end quote, ultimately give it a positive review. Other critics hailed the environmental perspective. Chauncey Mabe of the South Florida Sun Sentinel calls the book, quote, one of the most satisfying environmental books of recent memory and devoid of self-righteousness, alarmism, or tiresome doomsaying, end quote. Tom Spears of the Can West News Service concludes, quote, it's more a portrait of ourselves taken through an odd lens, end quote, and, quote, sometimes an obituary is the best biography. End quote. Section 5. Genre. A non-fiction environmental book, The World Without Us is grounded in environmental and science journalism. Like other environmental books, it discusses the impact that the human race has had on the planet. Weissman's thought experiment removes the judgments and sufferings of humans by focusing on a hypothetical post-human world. This approach to the genre, which, quote, throws the spotlight on the earth itself, end quote, was found to be creative and objective. Weissman's approach to the environmental genre was said to leave no relevant message, only trivia, because the findings deal only with a future after humans. Addressing his approach, Weissman said that eliminating the human element eliminated the Quote, fear factor, end quote, that people are doing something wrong or that they will die. It is meant to be read as a fantasy, according to the author. 
Josie Appleton of Spiked related the book to, quote, today's romanticization of nature, end quote, in that it linked, quote, the decadence and detachment of a modern consumerist society, end quote, with an ignorance of the efforts required to produce products so easily disposed. Appleton also felt the book countered the, quote, nature knows best, end quote, notion by highlighting the randomness of natural forces. Weissman's science journalism style uses interviews with academic and professional authorities to substantiate conclusions, while maintaining the, quote, cool and dispassionate tone of a scientific observer rather than an activist, end quote. Weissman said he purposely avoided the activist label, quote, some of our finest science and nature writers only get read by people who already agree with them. It's nice to get some affirmation for whatever it is you believe is true, even if it's quite sobering, but I wanted to write something that people would read without minimizing the significance of what's going on, nor trivializing it, nor oversimplifying it." End quote. Richard Forte compares the book to the works of Jared Diamond, Tim Flannery, and E.O. Wilson, and writes that the world without us, quote, narrowly avoids engendering the gloom and doom ennui that tends to engulf the poor reader after reading a catalog of human rapacity, end quote. Mark Linus in The New Statesman noted that, quote, whereas most environmental books sag under the weight of their accumulated bad news, the world without us seems refreshingly positive, end quote. Demonstrating the optimism on the grim subject matter, Appleton quotes an ecologist from the book saying, quote, if the planet can recover from the Parmian, it can recover from the human, end quote. Section 6, Television Specials. While not directly related to the book, there have been several TV specials relating to the same topic. Number one, Life After People shows what would happen if humans disappeared instantly. Two, Aftermath, Population Zero, is the same as the above, but gives more details into certain things. Three, The Future is Wild, does not explain the disappearance of man, but rather it shows how life would evolve one, one hundred, and five hundred million years after our demise. Section 7, References. There are references available in the written form of this article. Please be sure to verify information found on Wikipedia using the references provided or cross-referencing the information yourself. Section 8, External Links. This section includes a list of external websites where you can find additional information on the subject matter of this article. Link 1, The World Without Us, official website. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org slash copyleft slash fdl.html.